In October 1982, the General Secretary of one of Britain's most powerful unions decided to resign. Sid Wheel had been leader of the National Union of Railway Men since 1975. Told by his executive to vote for the left-wing miners' representative Eric Clark at the Labour Party conference, he'd chosen instead to cast his vote for a candidate from the centre. As the news seeped out, the pressures on him to resign became irresistible. Three generations of the Wheel family had belonged to the NUR. It was an inauspicious way to go. You no, know, I have resigned and my resignation will take place in accordance with the rule. It's about 12 weeks from now. Is there any you... way in which the members could persuade you, the rank and file members could perhaps persuade you this again? This is the yes. parliament of the union. If the rank and file wanted their voice to be heard, it was here today. They made a decision today. I have no quarrel with it. That's the democratic process of my union. I have argued and accepted that all my life, and I'm not going to depart from it today. Well, well, you have a little time to consider it. What are your plans for the future when you do stand down? Well, I'll be able to get out my trout fishing rods more often. <laughs> Sid Wheel's career had started on the footplate, but his involvement in the union at local level, coupled with the death of his first wife and daughter in a car crash, led him towards change and a full-time job in the NUR. Well, the first job I was appointed to, based in London, was the relief officer of the union. And so that involved me travelling the length and breadth of the country to relieve our division officers who were based at all the key railway centres. And I was on that for about seven years for a variety of reasons. Did you like being a union official? Oh, yeah, I've been brought up in the movement, and uh, I decided to make my career in the union. I decided that at about age 30, as a matter of fact. Uh, so that was the step in the direction that I wanted to take. Uh, I didn't particularly like relief, because that meant being away from home a lot. But what it did do, it gave me, gave me an understanding of railways and railwomen and the union, the length and breadth of Britain. There wasn't any part of Britain I didn't know about. The hub of the union was the somewhat inappropriately named Unity House in London. Once he'd arrived there, it wasn't long before he realised that the top of the union ladder wasn't beyond reach. It was a point when I realised, having been in Unity House for a number of years, that I could be a leader if I set my stall out. But I never planned it, I never went on the railway, I didn't join the union to become the general secretary anywhere. That would have been the kiss of death because the trade union movement didn't like people who are careerists. Anyway, I didn't go into the movement for that. I went in it for a purpose, and that was to change the society and the conditions like my grandfather and my father. That was the objective. North Allerton in the 1840s was no more than a prosperous market town in North Yorkshire. But the arrival of the railway brought about some profound social and political changes. This is where I was born. In 1922, it was then called Gladstone Street. It was the only house that my father could get in the Thalaton. Landlords weren't willing to welcome a strong socialist like father. And I was brought up in a house that had uh, the Baptist chapel, the union, and the Labour Party running through the kitchen. This is a prosperous market town. You had Taurus to the left and Taurus to the right. But in the centre of this was this socialist group revolving around the Nathalaton branch of the National Union of Realm, which was the only trade union branch of any consequence in the town. I thought for a long time that every house in Nathalaton was like ours. Soon found out ours was unique. Our father was active in the union, as was grandfather. In fact, I've often said I was born into the Labour and Trade Union movement. As a matter of fact, I used to go collect trade union contributions from a signalman just down the road there. I never ever recall ever getting any money. But I used to go knocking on the door for his arrears. And Father used to send me there. Many a time I had my football boots ready to go and play football, and Father says, go and collect those contributions. There were 500 men employed on the railways in North Allerton when Sid's grandfather, William Wheel, started as a shunter in 1893. By the time he retired in 1934, he'd risen to the rank of passenger guard. My recollection of him were in about the early 30s as a schoolboy, standing on this station as a passenger guard. 
immaculate in his uniform, proud to be a railman and proud to serve the company. And he was followed by my father, again here, who joined the railway as a signal box boy in a box that was located at the end of the platform. In those days, it was a, an important railway junction. And after about a month at work, he was called out on strike by the union in a strike for recognition. And bear in mind, the union had been established in 1872, 40 years after the act of strike to gain recognition of the union. But one of my predecessors as General Secretary of the NUR negotiated no pay increase between 1920 and 1933. They actually negotiated a reduction of 5% in 1932. That's the sort of world they lived in. Difficult, tough, but at least they had a job that was secure. Not highly paid, and they had a pride in it. In areas like this that had suffered the depression, coal, steel, shipbuilding and railways, gone through the difficult times, solidarity of the workers was vital. So having a craft union was totally alien to the philosophy in which I was brought up and my father and my grandfather. Unity was strength and therefore separate unions like train drivers was brushed aside as totally irrelevant. The majority of North Allerton men belong to the NUR as opposed to the craft-based ASLEF. And in spite of being drafted onto the footplate at the outbreak of war, Sid was no exception to the family tradition. After a few months as a cleaner, he graduated to fireman at North Allerton Depot. This used to be a very busy, thriving, medium-sized engine shed. And today it's all gone. I drove trains from here, and I worked on the footplate as a fireman. It was an interesting job. There was comradeship on the footplate of the old steam locomotive, much of which I think has been lost today. But it's different now from when I first arrived here in 1940. The wind of change that was to sweep the railways in the 1950s and 60s hadn't arrived at that stage. Small tank engines still wended their unprofitable way from North Allerton to Garsdale, high in the Pennines. But from 1954, there were no more passengers, just a daily freight service to and from the limestone quarries at Redmire. I first worked up this line when I was about 16 year old as a teenager, the first year of the war. It was pleasant because you had the scenery to, to look at, the, beautiful Wensleydale. You brought the merchandise and you supplied the coal and so about every station you would detach coal wagons and coke and uh, the station master would have a joint function with the station master and the coal agent. Very lucrative, lucrative job by the way. But on these, this line and in the northeast generally they had started bonus schemes. In fact the faster the freight train went the more money you made. My recollection of working these lines were, which I strongly objected to as a fireman because I was having to produce the steam to go like hell. The recollection I have with heavy freight trains, usually limestone from the quarries, was coming back down here so fast that we couldn't stop. We used to take the crossing gates with us. A little bit later on in my 20s when I was becoming active in the union, I rebelled at this. and. Uh, we resisted this sort of working every time we could. After a year working freight trains up and down Wensleydale, he was transferred to the major railway centre of Darlington at the end of 1940. With a loco works employing up to three and a half thousand people and an engine shed which served the whole of the northeast, the town was at the hub of the steam age. But it's an era which he looks back on with mixed feelings. I look back with nostalgia about them. I wouldn't go over it again, though. Not at all. It was too hard work, and I'm not afraid of hard work, but this was sheer grind from morning to night, and you earned your money. I used to say to Joe Gormley, I showed more coal in a day, Joe, on here, than you shovel in a week. He was only pulling his leg, rather. As General Secretary of the NUR, he travelled the world. 
and whether meeting Chairman Mao's driver in Peking or an ex-British rail employee on a private line in Yorkshire, he developed a style which appealed to the rank and file. But politically, he could on occasion be naive. An unswerving lifetime support for the Labour Party when in government didn't always impress his counterparts in other unions. As Assistant General Secretary in 1966 or General Secretary in 1981, his stance was direct and not always guaranteed to win friends. We wish to get away from this free-for-all. And we are prepared to give this government, because this is the only vehicle that we know that will get us to the sort of society we want to see, we are prepared to give this government the breathing space that they ask us to give. In order that we can free this nation from the problems that have been bedeviling us right from the end of the Second World War. And therefore, call it an act of faith, if you like. Call it an act of loyalty to an organization that was in at the birth of this party. Call it economic logic, or whatever you like to call it, this union, the National Union of Roman, pledges its solid support behind the government today. And Joe, if you and members get 30, 40%, we're getting it because you can produce as much coal as you like, you won't get it moved. <laughs> Do you want the call to go out of this conference that the new philosophy is the Labour Party, that you now believe in the philosophy of the pig trough? Those with the biggest snout get the biggest share. <laughs> I reject it, my union rejects it, and if I'm the only one standing here saying it, I reject it until I drop down dead. I took the job in 75, and within about a fortnight, we were on the verge of a national rail strike, you see. And we turned down 27.5% pay increase. <laughs> and I'd been in in and out of 10 down in the street, 27.5% isn't enough. Why? I said, I want 30 the same as the miners and the power workers, you see. And I remember talking to Father one weekend while all this was on, and we were in the days of a national strike, and he said, what's all this about? Turning down 27.5%, he said, you want your head examined? <laughs> he said, well, that's the different world, you see. I was living in a totally different world from one my father knew. You were at the seat of power then? Oh yes, I couldn't get any higher. I realised then that uh, I'd been moving from one place to another to find where the power, exactly where it did lie. So I landed over 10 down this street. Well, you don't think about it at the time because you're involved in the crisis and you're fighting to survive. And so I went in to see Harold Wilson just as the same as I would have gone to see anybody else and talked to him like that. I remember coming out when we'd had a long discussion in the cabinet room. We'd reached no agreement. And then all gone out and I was the last to come out the door and he said, well, don't do anything drastic. Leave it with me, I'll see if I can sort it out. And within 24 hours, I got a phone call. I went to see Michael Foote, the Minister of Labour, Tony Crossland, the Minister of Transport. And as Harold would say, over beer and sandwiches, cobbled a deal together with 30%. No rail strike. That was the start and it was rough ever since. I mean, <laughs> every year was the same for eight years. The thing that the devils us in Britain, different from other parts of Western Europe, there is no consistency about policy. You change the government, the policy changes. And so, I mean, in regard to the fact we change governments fairly rapidly in Britain, you'll get no period of time in which you could stabilize your plans. And the industry I'm talking about, this one, this coach was built to last 30 years. And in that sort of time scale planning of this industry, five years with a politician, in fact, they're thinking weeks. Now you go and meet them at the sharp end of industry with management sometimes, because I agreed many times with British Railway Board, particularly Sir Peter Parker, we would go together and try to educate this minister wet behind the ears because he'd been there about six months. Because they change as rapidly as I changed my suit. 18 months and gone, another one. In fact, I used to go in many a time and just simply say to him, how long are you going to stay? Are you going to be here next week? And uh, 
That used to upset them, but those were the realities. I used to say, do you know what it's like at the sharp end of industry? We are dealing with a quarter of a million men and women in this industry serving the nation. We're trying to plan a railway, millions of pounds, and you sat there, we can't get a decision from you. Electrification, new rolling stock, we sat and argued. You got frustrated and the people you represented got frustrated and they left as the job deteriorated to the extent it is today. And what amazed me when I traveled over Western Europe, meeting German trade unions, Austrian, consensus of policy, changed the government, the policy of railways didn't change. In France, the change from a right-wing government to a left, Mitterrand, he inherits a massive investment program. You change from left to right in Germany, both carry on a program because railways are vital to the economy. And I went to Japan and found the same thing there. And I was looked at in amazement by a Japanese minister when I said, well, how do you justify spending all this money on the railways? He says, they're vital to the nation. He says, don't you do that in Britain? He says, no. And he pointed to this aircraft carrier in the Tokyo Bay, and we were in this restaurant high up. He said, uh, do you apply that same principle to aircraft carriers in Britain? Got to pay their way? I says, no, they're vital to the nation. He says, we treat our railways the same as you treat aircraft carriers. This lack of a coherent transport policy is something that troubles not only union leaders, but the rank and file as well. Now, this is, this is the, whole, the whole trouble. There's no stability on the railway as far as policy is concerned. The hours, shift work and that is a little bit better than it was Bye. years ago, but... Uh, at the same time, I think, in fairness to the staff we have today, they, they'll experience a lot of confusion, if that's a word for it, mm -hmm. uh, which no doubt it would appear from management. Yeah, definitely. And... Uh, well, what's the matter with management? Well, in my opinion, there's a lot to be desired from management, insofar as, well, it's down to managing. And what we want is people who's, who's in my book, Educated railway men been appointed to the top positions. Practical men. Practical mm. men know what they're talking about. There's too many blocks coming into engineering. There's too many interfering. With qualifications, though. College qualifications, not practical experience, as because you've said. Yeah. You mean, they should have come from the bottom. They can't do the practical work at all. They come out and they say, well, it works on paper, this, that, and do it through the computer and all the rest. But trains don't run on paper and no. computers. Well, but you, you also said, yeah, I mean, you. All you've got to do on the rail, to get on the railway at the present time is to have a degree in marine biology. Marine biology. <laughs> you're yeah, made. You're mad. You're mad. You're mad. You're mad. You're mad. You're clue. Yeah. <laughs> clue. Yeah. You don't at the to. same time, in fairness to the board, there's still too much interference in the present day, anyway, yeah. from government. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The most constructive minister I ever dealt with, and this is no political axe to grind about this, was uh, Bill Rogers. And we did make some progress, some measure progress with him. And he stayed for about two years. He was about the longest serving minister I had to deal with. But then we got the Tory government with a, a totally different approach. But even with them, we were beginning to work out an understanding, not without difficulty, because I remember going in 1981 with an agreed program with the railway board, which um, was a, a balance sheet of change. We would say, if we gave you A, B, C, and D, uh, guards of trains, better manning arrangements, and uh, intelligent use of manpower, would you give us electrification, uh, more investment in rolling stock? Uh, in other words, all the things we, we ne needed. And I remember going along to the minister then, Fowler, with Parker, and saying to him something like this, I said, well, now, I'll be glad to see the back of you, but you're going to be there for four or five years, and I'll have to do business with you. I don't trust you and you don't like me. See whether or not we can synchronize this. If you authorize electrification for East Anglia, which has been on your desk for two years, we will move on the manning of trains, step by step, so that we'll make sure that we aren't underselling or overselling each other. He said, that's a good idea. The trouble was he took about six months to make his mind up whether he was going to go down that road. And in the middle of that year, in 1981, he came along and said, right, I'll do a deal. A month after that, he left. Troubles followed thick and fast. 
the threat of both rationalisation and privatisation produced a wave of strikes by both ASLEF and the NUR during 1982. Sid Wheel's message to the government was quite clear. So therefore, let me say this to those politicians who work trains and railways and dig coal with their tongues and make steel with their tongues. Let me tell them this. <laughs> My union will not hesitate to use the, not only the spirit, but the words of our Triple Alliance if they attempt to take into private ownership centres like Doncaster, Crewe, Swindon, 30 years publicly owned, advocated for 50 years by my father and my grandfather. You think we're going to sit back and let them do it? The threat to the old guard was coming not just from the government, but from a new style of union leadership, typified by Arthur Scargill. Attempts to revive the 60-year-old triple alliance of coal, steel and rail unions failed and attempts to merge the three rail unions were hindered by the mutual distrust of Sid Wheel and Ray Buckton. For a start, I created the Federation. I sweated blood to do that because my union didn't want it. Because we'd advocated one union board for 80 or 90 years. And I knew that that wasn't attainable like that. So I then proposed through Len Murray a Federation. And we got it off the ground in 1981. Our 1982, industrial disputes and differences with the train drivers and all the flexible roster disputes, strained relationships and it almost collapsed. Now, some will say they got that abrasive Yorkshireman wheel out the way and the thing will work, but no, it was the policies that I disagreed about between the train drivers and myself. And what I have noted now is the NUR policy is the same as the train drivers. They, so I would think the train drivers are taking over the NUR, which so, would never have happened when I was there, by the way. So you and Ray Buckton are friends now, are you? Well, I, uh, the only time I had agreed with Ray was when I was talking about what sort of vegetables he grew and uh, I talked about railways, well, we couldn't agree because my, my, my concept was totally different. I am a total railman in the interest of the industry. My eyes are focused on the every grade and all the service. You can't look at this industry from the front end of the train. There's more to it than that. That kind of rhetoric didn't appeal to the predominantly left-wing NUR executive. At the 1982 Labour Party conference, their chance came. Sid Wheel cast his vote against their wishes, and within weeks, having failed to secure the backing of the rank and file, he'd little option but to leave. The railway system he left was a pale shadow of the one his grandfather had started on a hundred years before. Your period as General Secretary ended, I think, in painful circumstances. Can you tell me why and what happened? Well, uh, it's a question of a General Secretary exercising what he thinks is authority in the direction which is in the best interest of the Union. And I was in conflict with my Executive Committee, the style I had interpreted an annual conference decision about our vote, I voted at the Labour Party conference. And uh, not only that, but there'd been a long, a succession of differences between them and me about policy, what we should do with government and how we should tackle the problems of today. And basically it was that I believed in change. That we should harness change to our requirements, not resist it. And in that way, the industry could advance. That was a constant battle. Weren't you, at the end, a victim of what you've always believed in, and that's the exercise of democratic rights? No, I resigned. I resigned because I wasn't going to be uh, dragged around by the scruff of the neck. I believed in leading. If they didn't agree with me, they want somebody else. They knew what I stood for, and I was for the intelligent left. There were elements on my executive committee who are, I put it bluntly, on the idiot left. There was bound to be a conflict between them and me, but nevertheless, I was due to go at 60, and I was planning to go. I went about six months earlier than I planned, that was all. Would you have resisted the pressures if you had been younger? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd have fought them tooth and nail, but at uh, 60, I thought it was time for a change. 
and I've turned to other things now.